Okay, right. So, um, you know, I'm going to try and keep this short. Um, I used to have this as my final slide, but now I've started to give talks uh, with this as my first slide, which is just to say the starting point really for all of us in thinking about how to cope with this situation is that we cannot afford lockdowns. So that's true in many parts of the world. And it, I believe is also true in the UK. Lockdowns are a luxury that only the affluent within an affluent country can actually afford. As my colleague Martin Kuldorf recently put it, lockdowns are, uh, are like protect, are like focus protection for the liberal elite, essentially, and they, they protect those of us who can conduct our business through laptops and Zoom and whatnot, and have have some gardens that um, allow us to accommodate our children and others we care about, um, but they are absolutely disastrous at every level for the poor and the young, both in the global north and the global south. And actually one of the projects I've been um, involved with in initiating since I last spoke is called Collateral Global, where, where we seek to, um, uh, we're trying to develop a global repository for research into the collateral effects of COVID-19 lockdown measures. And when we say effects, we do, we are going to actually look at both positive and negative effects, but we do think it's very important to have these in focus before you can develop any kind of rational policy. So also what's happened, although I may have actually shown you this slide in, in August, is that, is that we, um, some of us have uh, got together um, uh, and various groups have um, got together to look at other solutions. And the one that um, I've been advocating is um, one of focused protection, whereby we shelter the vulnerable specifically, which is something that is afforded to us by the nature of COVID-19 in that it is, there is a clearly identifiable, identifiable group of people who are vulnerable to severe disease and death. Um, and in October, um, Jay Bhattacharya will be speaking as well, and Martin Kuldorf and I got together and produced um, something we call the Great Barrington Declaration, which um, has uh, put forward this idea and tried to flesh it out as, as a sort of policy uh, document and um, has attracted uh, attention, both negative and positive since then. So the idea is to take advantage of two things. One, that the um, pathogen acts in such a way as we can identify who is vulnerable and who's likely to die, which is mainly the elderly and the frail, but also those with certain comorbidities. Um, what this allows us to do is to um, protect the rest of the population from the harms of lockdown and which also allows immunity to accumulate in the population, what we used to call and hopefully will continue to call herd immunity despite it suddenly having become this rather dirty word. So, that's, uh, so this is possible if you shelter the vulnerable and allow the, um, the rest of the population to function. Normally, we'd recommended that we invest, in, of course, in therapy and vaccination, particularly since vaccination is a, is a means of protecting the vulnerable. And that's indeed what we now have with the array of vaccines at our disposal. And one of the other things um, that I th thought was missing from the debate and continues to be missing from the debate is that we need to think outside national boundaries and consider our responsibilities as international citizens in dealing with this solution. So of course, this is met with a barrage of criticisms. And the first of these is what if there is, which was put forward by people who thought we were somehow um, advocating something that would kill a lot of people. And the first objection was what if there is no naturally acquired immunity to um, this SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. And that we know um, is, is simply um, not true. There was no reason for us to think there'd be na no naturally acquired immunity to this virus. It uh, belongs to a family of other coronaviruses for which we have ample um, uh, evidence that there is naturally acquired immunity. And now we know 
now that so much time has elapsed, we have been able to do studies which confirm that COVID-19 elicits a long-term immunity. This is not always evident in um, whether people have antibodies in their blood at the time they're sampled, those could disappear, but the immune memory, the ability to fight the virus, um, particularly at the level of um, acquire whether or not you come down with severe disease and die is definitely retained. What that means is that we can um, continue to use this model, which is what is the basis of what most people um, use, uh, whether in a very simple form or a complicated uh, computer simulation form. A fundamental sort of framework known as the SIR framework is what people use to study the dynamics of um, COVID. And in this framework, people go from being susceptible to being infected and then recover, write down a set of equations or a computer simulation, and you get um, an epidemic where the accumulation of people in the recovered class who are immune, at least for the time being, causes the epidemic to turn over and, and um, start to die away. And this is something obviously that's hard uh, to, I mean, it's hard to determine whether the extent to which herd immunity has contributed to um, the, the decline in cases uh, that we see worldwide, are seeing worldwide at the moment. Um, but there are, in because of the um, interventions that we've been also been putting in place, but there are regions where um, it's incontrovertibly been herd immunity that has uh, uh, resulted in the resolution of at least what people would call the first wave of the um, epidemic, such as in Manaus in Brazil, and several papers have been published or um, showing both that the um, shape of the epidemic, the increase in deaths, hospitalizations, and its subsequent resolution um, was accompanied by an increase in the prevalence of antibodies, an indication that uh, a large number of people had been exposed to um, the virus. So this is implies that herd immunity plays an important role in the control of this virus and that we can use it as a tool in trying in keeping the risk of infection low to those who are vulnerable. Since then, um, however, in, in Manaus, we have seen a uh, resurgence of COVID-19 and the people, some of the authors of one of the papers that I just showed have um, within two weeks of publishing the paper came, uh, produced a commentary in which they suggested um, a number of reasons for why this might be happening. And one of these is that immunity against infection might already have begun to wane by December uh, following the, the, the first wave in in April. And this is also uh, it aligns with the concern that people have had in our focus protection hypothesis, which it, in which herd immunity plays a role. Um, what if herd immunity doesn't last forever? Or what if it doesn't last forever? Does that mean, as um, some people have suggested, that, um, that, that we can't get to herd immunity? Uh, there's, there are very good reasons to believe that it might not last forever because seasonal coronaviruses, other circulating coronaviruses, um, do not give you lifelong immunity in the way, for example, measles does. The pattern there is that it, these coronaviruses exist at a sort of endemic equilibrium uh, where people keep getting reinfected, but reinfections carry with them very little risk of severe disease and death, which is why we don't normally worry about coronaviruses. So if that's true of this coronavirus, um, how then can we think about herd immunity? Well, the truth is that whether immunity lasts forever or not does not actually impact upon the buildup of and maintenance of herd immunity. So you can have an SIR model in which people remain immune forever, or you can have what we call an SIRS model, which is probably a better um, metaphor for coronaviruses and in 
where people go from being recovered, they lose their immunity and become susceptible again. And in both cases, if you do the, um, the mathematics, you'll find that herd immunity is reached at a point where the proportion immune in the population is um, at a particular threshold that's determined by the fundamental transmission characteristics of the virus itself, which is reflected in this quantity R0. And this is the same, that level, that level at which um, everything settles, what we would call an endemic equilibrium, the level of immunity in the population is the same for both the SI and the SIRS. In other words, the rate of loss of immunity does not influence the establishment or maintenance of herd immunity. Um, in contrast to uh, many statements that were made, and the one that I'm showing you here is from an article in Nature, uh, which entitled The False Promise of Herd Immunity, uh, which suggests that, that you can never reach herd immunity through natural transmission if there is a rate of loss of immunity. Um, I often use this uh, cistern analogy to explain what's going on here. Within a cistern, the level of water is maintained at a constant, um, it's a constant level maintained, it, um, and, and this is independent of the rate at which water flows in and out. So measles would be a system in which water is flowing out um, very slowly, trickling out slowly um, as people die, and then you get new infections from newborns um, or people born into the population filling up the system. Coronavirus is a little different. You get water flowing out quickly, um, people being reinfected and um, coming in um, to the, sorry. Um, but the, the system keeps, uh, maintains the level through a more dynamic loss of water, um, loss of infected, sorry, immune people, reinfections. But importantly, those reinfections do not carry with them a high risk of disease or death, and therefore we still maintain um, the endemic equilibrium we want where the deaths are kept low. The other thing that we um, uh, know now is that previous exposure to other coronaviruses does give you some level of protection against, particularly against disease from the new virus. And so in fact, the system, going by the system analogy, we didn't actually start with an empty system with coronavirus and some work that my group, Jose Lorenzo and Francesco Pinotti, have done shows that under those circumstances, you don't really, the level of exposure required in a population to reach endemic equilibrium is much lower. So we mustn't confuse low ob observations of low prevalence of antibodies with, um, that does not mean that we haven't reached a level where things are being kept in control by herd immunity. Furthermore, uh, once you factor in effects of seasonality, you can start to find patterns that correspond entirely to what we've observed in many parts of the world um, in terms of an initial early peak and a seasonal increase at a later point in time. And this is, these are just some simulations showing how the duration of immunity in combination with seasonality can give you those patterns paper published in Science uh, a few months ago also um, uh, reveals that the, that shows the same sort of dynamic occurring. This is from Brian Grenfell's group, again an SIRS model, but here they make the distinction again between being reinfected and infected for the first time, which allows you to see that you can easily replicate and understand what's going on and where we're headed in terms of a new virus coming in to which there was some immunity um, to a lot of immunity already to disease, some immunity to infection, and how obviously that would cause an initial large peak, but then settle into this pattern whereby you get um, the, the infection levels sort of oscillate around an equilibrium uh, due to seasonality and other considerations. So that could certainly be what underlies this uh, in recent increase in Manaus. But other explanations that the, the authors offered, which um, are pertinent to, to the current sort of discussion around uh, what's happening with SARS, 
Markov to is that uh, um, there are new lineages emerging and these may have properties that allow them to cause a second epidemic. For example, um, there may have been a new lineage that occurred and we know there are new lineages emerging in uh, Manaus and in, in Brazil, which um, have a higher inherent transmissibility than pre-existing lineages. So this P1 lineage is one of the variants of concern that's emerged in Brazil that people are worried about now. Um, the real question is, are, oh, and there are several others, but you know, that's why we've, the UK has closed its borders, uh, obliging people to stay in quarantine, and apparently you can go to prison now for 10 years for lying about having gone to Portugal en route. Um, and these, are all predicated on this idea that some of these new variants that are arising are more transmissible. Are they? Well, in order to understand this, we have to, again, we can employ the SIR framework, but this time we have to think about variation in, in the possible um, strains and variants of, of the virus. And the simple answer is that, um, indeed, it may well be that some of these variants are more transmissible, but the truth is that within a system where you have a lot of immunity shared amongst the variants, as you will have, because we know they're strong cross responses, not just amongst variants of coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but also amongst within the whole coronavirus family. What you tend to get under these circumstances is competitive exclusion. So the strain with a higher R0 wins. And then what that means is that even with a marginal increase in transmissibility, that could see a new variant sweep through. But that does not really have much of a material effect or difference in um, how we deal with the virus. In other words, the surge in the virus cannot be ascribed to a new variant, or it's very improbable that the reason why we're seeing surges is because the new variants are more transmissible. On the contrary, what's much more likely is the new variants are slightly more transmissible. Um, and because they're in a very competitive environment due to all the herd immunity that's built up, and because some of these mitigation methods, lockdowns also make the scramble for, intensify the scramble for susceptible individuals. Because of these circumstances, we are favoring variants that have only a marginal um, uh, advantage in terms of transmissibility. The other big question is, are these variants more virulent? And the truth is that we don't know, but it's unlikely. So far, the data don't seem to say so, despite these scary headlines. And generally within these systems, what you have is a sort of trade-off between virulence and transmission. So pathogens tend to evolve, but not always, towards lower virulence because that optimize, maximizes their transmissibility. But generally, what we'd expect are small var variations in virulence and transmissibility, and one strain will probably emerge as the victor. But it's very, it's improbable, it's not impossible, but it is much more probable that these strains will not be materially so different that we'd have to alter our policies. In any case, the Focus protection strategy kind of circumvents all these uh, uncertainties by putting forward a proposal which allows us to protect people and save them from severe disease or give them um, protection from severe disease and death, even if there were to be such uh, unusual, unlikely changes in the pathogen. Um, the other final uh, option that was considered by um, Esther Sabino and her colleagues is that, which we're all thinking about is, will these lineages, are these new lineages able to evade immunity generated in response to previous infection? Is this an immune escape? Now that is worrying, of course, because at the moment, uh, what we have, the best way of delivering focus protection is through vaccines. And so th this is a question that we uh, that needs to be answered and people are answering, trying to answer it. And it's clear and not surprising at all that some of these mutations, because they do happen to be in the very targets of immunity that actually um, are important 
for the virus to gain entry into cells, that some of these um, mutations are stopping or preventing the neutralization of the virus. But there are a wealth of other targets on the virus um, on the surface uh, of the spike protein, and certainly natural infection gives you a whole array of other responses. So it's unlikely to alter protection, at least against severe disease and death. It may all compromise uh, protection against infection, but it's not likely to alter protection against severe disease and death. So now we are back to this solution. We can refine it. We now have a good means of a very reliable way of sheltering the vulnerable by using all these vaccines that have been developed um, so quickly, so remarkably well, because these vaccines, one thing we know we can be sure of is no matter how much mutation there is and whatever else happens, that they're very likely to protect, continue to protect against severe disease and death. And that's what we want. We have no idea, even without mutation, how well they work against infection. And so it's not a good, um, it's not sensible to think of these vaccines as giving us herd immunity against transmission uh, in the way that measles vaccines can do. So I think we're going to have to rely on naturally acquired herd immunity in combination with vaccine um, induced protection, um, focused protection of the, of the vulnerables in order to provide a global solution to the problem. And once again, in doing that, we need to, instead of closing borders, try and think outside national boundaries. In the end, I hope we will achieve a solution, which another slide I tend to show, um, which combines our considerations of not just an understanding the logos, if you like, of this pathogen, how it, um, the, the science, as people like to call it, of how it spreads and how immunity accumulates and how to make vaccines, but also to integrate into that what we do as human beings, considerations of pathos, in other words, socioeconomic, um, environment um, considerations as well as ethos. How do we want to live our lives? Thank you very much.